Hello, everybody. Hi, Jim. Good afternoon. All right. Well, thanks uh, everyone for for joining us here today for uh, for our. Um, uh, today's presentation of the ongoing uh, 2021 cover le Covey Lecture Series. Uh, my name's Dan Dakin. Sorry, small technical technical glitch there, my apologies. Um, so my name's Dan Dakin, I'll be the, the moderator for uh, this afternoon. Um, the lecture will run about 45 minutes today and, uh, and then we'll have a question and answer period at the end. Um, so please feel free to ask any questions uh, throughout the lecture. Uh, you can just post it in the uh, in the, the question box there, and uh, we'll get to your questions at the end. Um, so I'm really pleased today to uh, welcome Dr. Jim Wilworth uh, as the speaker this afternoon. Um, Dr. Wilworth is an assistant professor in grapevine physiology in the Department of Biological Sciences uh, and a researcher right here at Brock University's Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute. Uh, the major component of his research program is focused on grapevine cold hardiness, cold hardiness uh, physiology and understanding how to maximize cold hardiness in v Vitis vinifera grapevines. Um, other projects uh, that he's involved in include a grapevine clone and rootstock evaluations to see how clone and rootstock selection can impact production, uh, including cold tolerance and wine quality uh, in cool climate regions. Uh, he's also involved in uh, novel uh, freeze and crop protection strategies and viticulture practices uh, to improve sparkling and still wine production. Um, so today, uh, Dr. Wilworth is going to share his latest research in a lecture titled The Impact of Cultivar Clone and Rootstock Selection on Grapevine Cold Hardiness. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Wilworth uh, to ask that he uh, please share his screen and go ahead with the lecture. Thank you very much, Dan. And let me just get my screen sharing here. So I hope everyone's doing well, you know, under these uh, circumstances. It'd be, it'll be great to be uh, back giving lectures right on campus uh, in, the, in the future, hopefully. But today it's virtual, so uh, hopefully everything goes well with the lecture and uh, you, you enjoy uh, the online uh, Covey Lecture Series this year. So today I'm, I'm going to talk about some of the research we've been involved with at Covey and at Brock here uh, over the last number of years. So there's been a number of people who have been involved with this work um, and I've listed them as, as co-authors here on this presentation. Um, uh, students, uh, Andrean Haber-Hache, Lin Suzan, um, as well as uh, uh, two of my technicians, uh, Stephanie Billick and, and Alex, uh, Alex Gunn as well as some of my collaborators, uh, Debbie Ingalls and, and, and Belinda Kemp, uh, both at Covey. So I wanna talk about the impact of cultivar clone and rootstock selection on grapevine cold hardiness. Um, this is something that's evolved over, over the last, you know, real decade uh, in terms of the cold hardiness research we've been doing. And I'm really excited to, to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing, uh, particularly uh, some of the work that uh, our PhD student, Andrian has been working on uh, over the last number of years. So I'll give you a bit of an update on that. But re really where a lot of this comes from in, in when it comes to cold hardiness or even looking at uh, different uh, vine material for our region is really to deal with our, our climate and, and, and matching um, the, our, our plant material to our conditions regionally, but also to help deal with future changes to, to our climate. And a lot of that is associated with climate change. And there needs to be uh, agriculture adaptation to potential climate impacts. And it's really becoming more and more urgent uh, as, uh, as we move forward. You know, when you look at something like climate change, it's not a linear response, but uh, you know, more of an exponential uh, response here. So similar to what we're dealing with with the pandemic, you know, you can really get uh, uh, things changing very quickly. So we need a, a number of different potential adaptation strategies, and we need to have strategies that can limit um, some of the effects that we will see. And really the severity of the impacts will limit the effectiveness of any mitigation strategies. And there is also going to be some barriers. Uh, and so we need some real solutions and these need to be well integrated. And so this is where some of the, the clone rootstock evaluations and, and just our cold hardiness program in general is trying, is trying to uh, deal with. So climate changes are a reality, not only in Niagara and Canada, but worldwide. Um, some studies have indicated that we'll have a rise of the average temperature in, in the Niagara region and in Ontario in general 
uh, more heat waves, more days uh, above 30 degrees Celsius, uh, and then higher amounts of uh, extremes in volatility. So that could be higher drought incidences. Uh, we might see reduced snow cover, increased rainfall in winter, uh, and more of these extreme weather events. You know, uh, just even uh, the other day, I think we broke a, a heat record for March uh, here locally. So in reality, we, what we do when we're farming is we're farming the extremes. And weather can have a significant impact on our production. And an example of that is just looking at how great production can vary over the course of like 20 years here in Ontario. And this is just looking at tonnage uh, across the region and here in Ontario. And I can tell you right now that each one of these uh, peaks and in, in, in valleys and so on in, in production are weather related. Uh, it's, 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 it's almost all weather relation here. And a lot of it has to do with the winter. Uh, particularly those really low yield years of 2003 and 2005. And we started launching the Cold Hardiness Program uh, and, and doing a lot more with respect to research, outreach, and service in 2010 here at Brock. And you could see that uh, even though in, in 14 and 15 we, we had some, um, some low years, there were nothing compared to uh, what we saw in 2003 and 5 uh, before we had any type of uh, Cold Hardiness uh, Program here. So it shows that you know what we're doing is already having an impact, but we want to uh, continue to look at uh, improving sustainability not only now, not only currently, but um, in the future as well. And so we want to improve production and quality. And one of the the best ways to do that is through appropriate uh, vine selection. So over the years, there's been a lot of work done regionally uh, to match vine material to regional conditions as well as the specific site, but that's still ongoing. Uh, we have a very diverse region. Uh, we grow a lot of different cultivars, and we're starting to focus more and more on on cultivars that work for our region. But we still grow uh, well over thirty Vitis vinifera varieties uh, in the area, um, and part of that is that we do have a a, a diverse region. Uh, but specific matching of 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 material to to site can be a bit complicated because our climate and, so and soil do vary significantly. So. There isn't just like a, a, a one vine solution for all areas or all the same rootstock everywhere, that type of thing. We do have a lot of vintage variation as well. So you have to kind of uh, uh, deal with uh, some of the extremes and some of the different vintages that we have. Uh, and the vintages can vary with respect to not only the growing season conditions, but also our weather, our weather conditions in the winter. You know, we can have extremely cold winters and extremely cold marches like we had last year. And then look at this year, we're having a very uh, mild winter and a, and a really warm March. And neither of them are necessarily a, a great scenario to have because they're so, they're so variable. And climate change will lead to more of that, uh, more changes in, in our weather in general, like I've, I've talked about earlier, uh, but also that volatility and more extreme weather. And so when it comes to adapting to climate, a lot of this can be accomplished though through more resilient plant material. And, 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 and vines that are matched appropriately uh, to the terroir. So it is an important resource for, for climate adaptation, uh, plant material, and it could be everything from different species or crossing of different species through breeding programs, uh, looking at traditional cultivars. And what I'm gonna talk about even more other than just cultivars is looking also at clone and rootstock. And then without question, quality of the plant material is also extremely important. And Brock has been involved, uh, as well as other institutions, uh, working with the, uh, the Canadian Grapevine Certification Network uh, to develop a domestic clean plant program. And that's extremely important. You need healthy material to start with. And it also helps you know if it's true to type. So it's actually the, the cultivar of, of, that you want and also the clone. So when we look at grapevines, it's a really cool, um, uh, commodity because it, it is so diverse. Uh, you know, we have over 60 species of, of, of vitis, uh, over, you know, 14,000 cultivars. Uh, many of them are, uh, you know, have different names of, depending on their locate, uh, their region of, the, that they're grown and so on. You know, you can think of Syrah or Syrah, Shiraz, same cultivar, uh, just a different name. And then Something that we'll talk about more is, is intra varietal diversity and looking at clones and even ecotypes within major cultivars. So, you know, the origins of some of these clones are vary, and and we think that that does have an impact. In, and we'll talk about that more in this lecture. 
Um, in terms of grapevines, they, they do differ with respect to their growing season requirements, their drought tolerance, uh, all of the hardiness aspects such as chilling requirements and uh, how they respond to, uh, how, they, how they acclimate to the cold, uh, how they deacclimate, uh, as well as their, their maximum hardiness. And, and a lot of those are, are controlled by, uh, by the environment and, 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 the, and, uh, and the genetics of the, of the plant. Uh, and we'll talk about that more. Uh, also fruit maturation, growth habits, uh, et cetera. And so when we have changes in the environment, it's going to impact how they perform. And, and so this is one of the things we're looking at now is how, how these cultivars, uh, as well as clones, and, uh, respond to different seasons, uh, different locations, and so on. When it comes to grapevine clones, I have an, uh, just a picture there of, of just some examples of, 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 of the Pinot family clones. Uh, everything from uh, skin mutations that lead to uh, the difference between uh, Pinot Noir, Pinot Blanc, and Pinot uh, Gris. Uh, you could see a sport mutation there on that uh, cluster there. And then you can see some of our, our common clones, some of the uh, Entov uh, Dijon clones and Champagne clones below. Uh, and you can see how they, they can vary uh, with respect to their, and that's all Pinot Noir, with respect to how they grow, uh, their cluster morphology, berry size, flavor and color, um, whether they, they're more early maturing clone or a later maturing clone. And as a result, they can have some differences with respect to their disease uh, tolerance. And one thing that we're really interested in is starting to focus on cold tolerance. Rootstocks are another important component of the vine, um, particularly because of things like phylloxera. And so we, we graft a lot of our grapevines worldwide uh, to, um, to rootstocks in, in Ontario and most of Canada is, is no exception. Uh, and so they will vary with respect to their, uh, their levels of resistance to pests. Uh, their tolerance to different abiotic stresses like water stress, or we can even talk about cold tolerance like today. Uh, growth, we have uh, some rootstocks that, uh, that uh, well, well, rootstocks will impact the growth of the vine. Some are lower vigor rootstocks, some are higher vigor, as well as uptake of things like water and nutrients as well. And like I mentioned, the quality of the material is, is super important with respect to uh, general performance, true to tightness, uh, resistance to stress. Uh, and so when you're selecting material and, and, and the material that's going to be most beneficial for all regions uh, is having clean material uh, that are that are through a good source of material, they're true to type, and that they're clean from any major viruses or diseases. Because anytime you have a, a vine that is not uh, healthy and it's not uh, uh, high quality, uh, it's not going to perform as you as you'd like it when it's not going to have ideal performance. And so along with many regions of the world, we've now established a, a evaluation for plant material. Um, and globally, there's a lot of efforts with respect to uh, having more disease resistant vines, uh, particularly uh, in the high quality wine grapes and, and, and in the old world, uh, as well as the new world. Uh, and, and most major wine regions have a dedicated long-term evaluation and or breeding program. And one of the key things for us here in Ontario is that, and in Canada in general, is that we've transitioned to more of the Vitis vinifera uh, cultivars over the, over the past few decades. And so regional valuations of existing and new material are important in all of our provinces. And we each have different needs, different growing seasons, uh, all, all of those types of, uh, you know, the differences in the terroir. So what one variety in one location might not work well in another region, not only in Ontario, but in our different provinces and across our, and within our different provinces. But across all, cold tolerance is a major trait of interest. And also clean material is, is, is of high demand. And a lot of times in our selection process uh, in, in viticulture, historically, uh, cold tolerance has not been one of the major traits of interest for, at least for vinifera and for clonal selection of vinifera. Uh, it has certainly been for breeding programs such as the uh, Minnesota breeding program uh, where they've, uh, they've, they've bred specifically for enhanced cold tolerance. But uh, for vinifera, it, it, it's really been all about, um, you know, fruit quality and, and, uh, and growth and not even that much with respect to disease until recently. So for the rest of the lecture, I'm gonna talk about cold hardiness. And our cold hardiness 
when we talk about our cold hardiness program, first I just want to have one slide just to talk a bit about hardiness. And if you look at hardiness, if you have to define it, it's the ability of plant tissue to survive freezing temperature stresses. Now it's, it's a very complex trait and has many contributing factors. Um, and, and, and the biggest uh, factor are the genetics of the plant. So the genotype has a huge role with respect to how hardy uh, the vine will be. And if you look at our native uh, species that are grown in the northern uh, parts of, of Eastern North America, uh, like uh, Vitis riparia, uh, they can be hardy to, to you know, below negative 40 or around negative 40. Uh, whereas Venus, a lot of Venus vinifera cultivars are only hardy uh, in, into the negative 20 range. And it is highly influenced by the environment. Uh, so if you're growing grapes at, in a cooler region, and you, you will have, uh, the vine may uh, reach its genetic potential with respect to uh, how cold tolerant it will be. Uh, and so it can be highly dynamic in terms of during the season and some of our responses in terms of uh, how the vine responds to the environment uh, can, can be quite dramatic, really. And, and, and this is where uh, if when you try to link cold hardiness to um, uh, climate suitability, it's actually a little bit more um, complicated uh, than than previously thought, as opposed to just looking at win or maximum hardiness in a, in a in a plant and saying, okay, this vine's going to do well because it's hardy to negative 25. You know, there's more to it than that. And as we're doing more work with hardiness, you realize that it, that suitability can also be a, a dynamic. So when it comes to hardiness, the, the plants go through uh, a period of acclimation where they gain cold tolerance. Uh, this is happening early in the season, or sorry, later in the growing season uh, in, in August and September when you start to get lignification of the vine. At the, uh, at the coldest period of, of, of uh, dormancy, the plants generally reach their maximum cold hardiness. And then as we're getting into late winter and spring and, and we're getting warmer temperatures, warmer soils, uh, we're starting to see deacclimation. And that's where we're at right now uh, with respect to the, the phase that the vines are in. So with respect to our overall research program at Brock, uh, it's been well integrated with, with respect to um, fundamental research, applied research, as well as uh, service to the industry. And one of the key things we've been doing is monitoring hardiness of many cultivars grown in Ontario. We've also been trying to understand how climate and genotype influence the hardiness response, uh, ultim ultim optimize hardiness through cultural practices, and really starting to look at the fundamentals uh, of understanding the mechanisms of cold hardiness and specifically uh, acclimation, but focus more and more at deacclimation and, and even reacclimation where the plants gain back some hardiness after losing uh, tolerance. And what I'm going to be talking about today with respect to cultivars, clone, and so on, um, they may all differ with respect to how they respond to uh, to these different phases of hardiness or stages of hardiness. Uh, we want to improve resiliency of grapevines to the effects of extreme climate, have plants that may be more resilient to things like cold deacclimation, uh, where they, they may not uh, deacclimate as rapidly uh, to help deal with some of the, you know, the warm weather that we're seeing now. Uh, and also we want to develop some novel freeze mitigation strategies. So again, that we have uh, good plant material, we know how to grow uh, the vines the best to optimize their hardiness and, and really have uh, more tools in our toolbox to deal with freeze injury. Now, when it comes to cultivars, it's going to be, there's a huge difference with respect to uh, how cold tolerant these plants are. I've already alluded to that when we're talking about Vispera versus Vitis uh, riparia, or Vitis riparia versus Vitis vinifera. And then uh, when we look at vinifera, we have you know different pearls of of and categories of origin and groups of origin. Um, so that does make a difference with respect to uh, their inherent cold tolerance and how they also respond to the environmental conditions during uh, dormancy. We have our traditional French hybrids, which have you know some uh, North American uh, uh, background in them, uh, parentage as well as having uh, you know French. Let's say for the French hybrids. Uh, some French cultivar uh, in their parentage, like Bacle Noir, Marechal Fauche, Vidal Blanc. Uh, and then we have some new hybrids, uh, specifically some of the ones from the Minnesota breeding program, like Marquette, uh, Frontenac, and, and, and some of those. Uh, we still have some native North American species, 
Uh, but you know, in this context, I'll talk more about ones that are just growing uh, native uh, or native riparia. And then we're going to have a lot of variation within and between these categories. So just a, a pretty simple uh, uh, graph here uh, that uh, uh, I, I got from uh, Andrian. Uh, and it's just looking at uh, some of the different key cultivars that we grow with respect to Chardonnay and Riesling being two of our more hardy vinifera varieties, and then Sauvignon Blanc and Merlot, which are a more tender vinifera varieties. So you can see the differences here with respect to, you know, what we consider the true cool, cool climate, um, some of the cool, true cool climate cultivars like Chardonnay and Riesling. And you can see they, they acclimate at, um, uh, at a faster rate, uh, the, the maximum hardiness uh, is lower than with the, the Sauvignon Blanc or, or, the, or the Merlot. But you can see they do respond differently with respect to um, how they deacclimate. And so uh, cultivars like Chardonnay, uh, they generally uh, will lose their hardiness, have earlier bud break than some of the, uh, some other vinifer cultivars. And so we've been trying to understand how these, these different cultivars uh, respond at different years. Um, some of your Sauvignon Blanc can be a little bit more hardy than other years. Uh, here's an example of Merlot, for example. And you can see how dynamic hardiness can be and how the growing season as well as vintage, uh, sorry, dormant weather can impact the, the level of hardiness. And at all stages here, whether it's at the beginning here and act during acclimation, maximum hardiness, uh, you know, between January and March, as well as from March to May, uh, and every year it could be quite variable. And this is one reason why we do monitor um, hardiness in Ontario and provide that service through VinAlert to the industry. Because at any given calendar date, um, this, can, uh, this can vary. If you went by just saying on, on, on February 15th, uh, fines are hardy to negative 23, uh, you might be in trouble if you're in you know, years like 2016, 17, 15, 16, uh, and, and so on, uh, you, they, they could be quite different. And you can see here that our LT50s can be uh, even, uh, or they could be greater than, than five degrees Celsius from one year to the next. And this is one thing that we do find with our tender cultivars. And I'll talk about a little bit more near the end of the lecture with uh, some of the work that uh, Andrian has done. But one of the things that you'll find is that a, a, a tender variety like Merlot it is it is seems to be much more susceptible and have a larger range in its LT50s throughout the dormant period. Whereas something like Chardonnay, uh, if you look at the maximum hardiness during de or, sorry and during acclimation, so you know looking at uh, mid October into into the beginning of March, yeah, there could still be a two degree or more difference with respect to its hardiness at a given calendar date. But in general, it's a lot tighter of uh, and less very less variable from year to year compared to a tender cultivar such as Merlot. And again, you could see when we get into this time of year, uh, getting into March, that the environmental conditions can have a big impact with respect to how they're losing cold tolerance. And right now with Chardonnay, uh, it's right here on this red uh, circle, if you could see it with my pointer, and we're getting 20 degree weather right now. So we're expecting that we're going to start to see a big push of the vines, uh, with them losing hardiness. So again, this is another year where we're going to have um, a different deacclimation uh, period. Uh, and it might be similar to uh, what you see here uh, in, in 2011, 12, uh, where we lost 15 degrees of hardiness in the matter of about uh, a week and a half. Um, and, and you could see at this time of year, I mean, we can have temperatures in, in, in cultivars where they're only uh, you know, hardy to negative six, or they can be as hardy as negative 20. So that's, uh, this is where climate change can really come into play uh, with respect to how it's going to impact the, the dormancy and, and the hardiness of our, of our uh, cultivars that we grow. And so if we can have uh, plants that may be more uh, res resilient to losing that hardiness, it, might, it may be beneficial or to use other tools to help delay that. Uh, and and uh, that's where some of our, our evaluation programs are, are looking at. Even with uh, a really hardy cultivar like um, Marquette, 
uh, you could see that it can have, have be very, uh, it can vary quite a bit uh, from one year to the next. And the environment plays a huge role in this. So in our polar vortex winters, the vines were hardy uh, and had maximum hardiness down to uh, below negative 30. But in a warm vintage, like I pointed out, which or, or a warm winter, like 2016, 17, uh, you could see they're you know close to almost 10 degree, 10 degrees less hardy, and they also deacclimate at, at much quicker rates. And so this is where and and at that time during March and April they can be as susceptible to the cold as uh, the vinifera cultivars like Chardonnay. And so this is something where the the suitability of a, of a cultivar can be quite dynamic as well. So if you're in a cold region um, that uh, that warms up uh, quickly in, in March and April, uh, these cultivars may lose some of that tolerance and, and be more susceptible to a, a late winter frost or a spring frost, uh, which which is not uh, not good in any situation. Uh, once you have uh, water moving through the plant uh, later in deacclimation, uh, getting closer to bud break, uh, any type of winter injury then and freeze injury can be pretty catastrophic because you can lose trunks and and uh, in, in a lot of vine parts as opposed to just buds. And so if you look at the course of three, three different years, you could see uh, just how hardiness can, can really vary amongst cultivars and, and how uh, the vinifera ones like, uh, like Chardonnay and Riesling, uh, they might be, uh, they're a little bit more resilient to deacclimation and whereas, but, they were, but they're not going to be as winter hardy in, in midwinter or early in acclimation. However, uh, later in the year, uh, they can be, uh, or sorry, later in the year, Marquette and Frontenac can lose that hardiness quite quickly, and they can actually even be more susceptible uh, to to freeze injury, even compared to some of the vinifera. So it, it just shows the dynamic nature and how uh, the genotypes really have an impact. Now, I want to just talk about uh, some of the work we're doing now with respect to looking at uh, not only looking at cultivars, but starting to look at clones and rootstocks. And one of the reasons for this is after some of our really cold winters, uh, we saw that uh, the clones, uh, or cer sorry, certain blocks of Chardonnay, for example, looked a lot better, had much better survival rates, uh, but uh, uh, there, we couldn't really explain why that one half of the block looked better than the other. And then we realized there were actually different clones. So then we started to look at, okay, are there uh, differences in our clones? And so we also wanted to look at, um, a, a formal evaluation program. Everything from vine performance to, uh, to uh, basically a vine to glass approach. And to look at this as a long-term solution to mitigate climate change and continue to build the quality and consistency of our industry using our core varieties. And so not only looking at clones, but also looking at rootstock. Um, rootstocks, as I already mentioned, have a, have a big, play a big role with respect to degrees of resistance to various uh, abiotic and biotic stresses. But they also may affect cold hardiness indirectly through um, through its their effects on on growth and ultimately production and vine balance. And uh, some some older research uh, from the 80s uh, looked at some different rootstocks and found that uh, there there were some rootstocks that were uh, uh, different with respect to their toler cold tolerance, and that 3309 was one of the most suited to cold temperature, and that uh, own rooted had the worst performance. So we wanted to see, you know, what if we, what if the vines we planted were more tolerant? Can we find within specific cultivars clones that are more cold tolerant? Uh, and so we're focusing on our core varieties. So let's look at different clones of these core varieties that we're growing here in Ontario and see if, if clone selection can reduce cold damage to our cold tender cultivars or make them more resilient. Uh, and also look at rootstocks. We have some core rootstocks that we're using and we want to see if, if rootstock, uh, particularly at certain sites or with certain clones, maybe even, could they improve cold tolerance? So we've been looking at a formal clone rootstock, cultivar clone rootstock evaluation program. Uh, it's funded through industry and then through the, the federal government, either through uh, NSERC previously, and now with the Canadian uh, Grapevine Certification Network and Agriculture uh, Agri-Food Canada uh, through an agri-science grape cluster. Uh, we're working with industry and we planted different vineyard blocks uh, of, of different clone rootstock uh, combinations for core varieties and they're on different soils. 
So one of the studies though I want to talk about is one, those are now in just getting into production and they're going to be bearing vines this year. So we're going to really start to continue on our core cultivars and looking at some new rootstocks, some common rootstocks, uh, older clones that we've that have been established here for many years as well as new clones. But for this point of the of the conversation, I want to focus on some work we've been doing in existing vineyards and really focus on some work that was recently published in AJEV. Uh, and our PhD student, Andron Habehache, uh, did this research. Uh, this is research looking at two different cultivars, a, a tender variety uh, or tender cultivar like Sauvignon Blanc and then a, a Riesling, which is another one of our core varieties, but it's more of our hardiest vinifera. And we looked at different rootstocks uh, for the Riesling, but also looked at different clones uh, for Sauvignon Blanc um, as well as Riesling. We've also done some work and we're continuing work with some of our other core cultivars like Chardonnay, looked at 12 different clones on one rootstock. Uh, there's a project ongoing right now with the, one of our master's students, Link Suzanne, uh, who's working with Cabernet Franc uh, with two of our most common clones on some different rootstock. Uh, looked at some research with Riesling with a combination of, of various ones of, uh, uh, of different clone and rootstock as well as uh, different Pinot Noir clones all grafted on, on Riparia Gloire. So the ones I'm going to focus on are, are Zonder Ange research uh, with Sauvignon Blanc and um, uh, Riesling and those different clone and rootstock combinations. But I also want to point out just how different these Chardonnay clones can be, uh, and we, especially when you look at 10 different ones. And you can see that there's substantial differences between uh, like a clone like 95, 96, uh, or sorry, more like 96, I should say. Uh, and if you compare that to uh, some of the other clones like 124, which isn't that common, and this is probably why, <laughs> It is. Uh, it can be quite uh, uh, less with respect to its cold tolerance, not just during um, maximum hardiness, but uh, through different periods of the year. And there can be some differences from one year to the next. But you know, some of our core uh, clones that we do use are some of our most hardy. And um, please do not. Uh, I recommend that you do not just take this and use this as a guide for planting. I'll have a disclaimer. Uh, we are working in the future for a um, uh, clone uh, rootstock best practices guide for the region. So uh, please don't cherry pick my slides. Uh, and I'm not going to advocate one clone or another one for this uh, presentation, but just show you how they can vary. Uh, with respect to the experimental design, this is just some of the work for the, the Sauvignon Blanc and Riesling project. Uh, we did do this work in a commercial vineyard. Uh, uh, you know, one of our visionaries in the industry planted uh, a number of different combinations. And so we tapped into this. Uh, we looked at different, uh, four different clones of Sauvignon Blanc, two different clones of Riesling. And then we also had a rootstock comparison with Riesling. Not only did we monitor hardiness through differential thermal analysis uh, in, in these different uh, experimental blocks, uh, we also monitored things like phenology, fruit composition, looked at things like vine balance and so on and, and looking at yields and pruning weights, uh, crop loads, for example, uh, to see if there were indirect uh, influences on the hardiness and not necessarily related to, to clone, or, for example, and it might just be an indirect effect of just being undercropped or overcropped, uh, as well as uh, things like bud survival and so on. So as a, just a snapshot, you can see here how the two cultivars differ. Uh, just as I've, I've shown in other slides, uh, you can see that they can be grouped by cultivar when you when you plot them all out for one 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 particular year. Uh, you can see the separation between the Riesling and the more uh, orangey brown uh, lines compared to the the green blue uh, of Sauvignon Blanc. But let's get into some of the details when you look at uh, some of the clone effects specifically. And um, this, if you want to, if you want to view the paper, you can you can view it uh, on the Age of website. It's open access, so uh, you can you can take a, a better look at it there if you're interested. Um, with respect to the influence of clonal selection, uh, there there have been uh, through the through the various years of the study, um, we found that clones can be a, a significant source of cold hardiness differences, uh, and it does depend on the clone, but also the cultivar. And so the, there can be some uh, 
some vintage variation, if you want to, if you want to say that, uh, with respect to how the environment uh, impacted uh, some of the responses. And in some years, with the, with both the Sauvignon Blanc and the Riesling, um, some uh, cultivars and some responses of, of the clones and rootstocks uh, was more was more uh, significant, I guess you could say, uh, based on the vintage, uh, the growing season and the, the weather conditions uh, during dormancy did have an impact on that. So it has something to do there with uh, how the plants are responding uh, to things like, uh, uh, you know, uh, heat units in the season, uh, uh, moisture levels likely in the soil probably play a role as well in those types of impacts. But what we did find was that certain clones, particularly uh, 530, uh, if you look at the yellow line there, you could see that in many years, it, uh, it was more tolerant at, during many of the different periods, particularly in maximum hardiness and, and uh, later in acclimation. Uh, that one in, in 376 were some of the two, two of the hardier clones, whereas uh, clone 242 and 297 were often less hardy. Uh, and, and you could see there just how, uh, how the effects were from one year to the next. And, you know, you could see in 1617, uh, 530 was was much more uh, hardy in December, uh, January, leading into February, but it was not so much the case in, in 1718 during that period of time, whereas 376 was was just as hardy uh, as as uh, as uh, 530. With with Rieslings, we found significant differences between the Riesling clones, one grafted to Ripera Gloire in all three years. And we found no differences with respect to things like crop load. Uh, that we did not find that uh, crop load had any impacts, even though there were some differences in crop load. Uh, we found consistent effects of these clones. And whereas 239 was uh, was was more hardy uh, on riparia uh, rootstock year after year. Now rootstock, one of the things that we found was that um, uh, in some years uh, there were. They were, uh, it was less important with respect to the effects of, of with rootstock. And if you look here on 239, uh, clone 239 for Riesling grafted to three different rootstocks, uh, you could see that riparia can, can have some greater cold tolerance uh, at, for some vintages like 16 and 17, uh, particularly at certain times of the year. Uh, whereas in 2018, 19, uh, there weren't as many uh, differences here. And, uh, and so, Kind of what we expected, uh, you know, we thought that clone influence and, and obviously cultivar would be the greatest uh, impact on hardiness, but rootstock does have some effect. But one of the things that's really interesting is that we we found some clone rootstock interactions. And this is in the case where uh, in this particular example, we found this in some of our other research ongoing now as well. I'm not going to talk about detail because it's not published yet, but um, and, and students have to uh, finish their thesis projects, but uh, it is something that we are finding that at specific sites, there can be a clone and rootstock interaction. And in this particular case, what we found was that clone 49 actually did better on SO4 rootstock, uh, but 239, as I showed you in the previous slide, uh, did better and had greater cold tolerance on riparia. And then again, there can be the, the yearly variation as well. And we found this, uh, uh, you know, especially with the differences between years like 2006, 16, 17, and 18, 19. This is just a snapshot. I'm not showing you what clone combinations these are and rootstock combinations, but I do want to show you that we are finding in other cultivars the clone rootstock effect as well. We're finding some clone uh, influences in this study, but we're also finding some uh, clone uh, rootstock interactions with respect to Cabernet Franc. This is something that was really interesting and it goes back to the, those slides that I showed you earlier, looking at Merlot and the yearly variability uh, and comparing it to something like uh, a cultivar like Chardonnay. And when we, when we were looking at the data from Andrian's research, uh, we found that with respect to some of the cultivars, uh, that particularly when we compared hardy ones to what we consider hardy compared to tender, is that if you look on the left, you could see the, the box plots of, 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 of the hardiness um, monitored from 
uh, from October into April, like getting closer to bud break. And you can see that, you know, if you kind of look in the middle of those, of the, that, uh, the box plot there, you could see, you kind of visualize the line that I showed you earlier. And you could see that uh, Riesling has, is a lot less variable in terms of its hardiness. And we know this from uh, sampling of, of vines. And we know that when it comes to acclimation, they're, they're acclimating from base to tip. And so your sampling location on the cane makes a big difference with respect to if you're, you know, if you're sampling at uh, uh, bud position one or if you're sampling at bud position 15, you're going to get some variation hardiness just based on how the plants acclimate. But with these studies, we're, we're sampling on uh, the exact same areas of, of the canes. And one of the key things that we're finding is that uh, with, with our tender cultivars, uh, like Sauvignon Blanc, and, and an example of it is just on one sample date on the right there, and, and this is a great slide that Andre on provided, uh, is, you know, how, the, how variable uh, Sauvignon Blanc buds are compared to, and with respect to their hardiness, compared to something like Riesling. And you can see that, you know, Riesling, a lot of the buds are acclimated between tw negative 20 and negative 25, whereas Sauvignon Blanc, some of those buds can acclimate to the same level of hardiness as those Riesling buds. You know that's below negative twenty, uh, but many of them are are poor with respect to their acclimation. And this was earlier in the season, so we didn't have any winter kill yet or anything like that. This was in the middle of uh, December, but it really shows you the the variability. And so it seems that um, this, this the lack of uniformity of hardiness with some it, it is one of the reasons maybe why uh, we see. Uh, more damage with some of our, our tender cultivars and what, why we consider them tender. And so this can help contribute to the susceptibility of a variety like Sauvignon Blanc uh, to cold temperatures. We do find that some cultivars are just really, really sensitive to winter injury and their buds are really, really sensitive. Uh, and, and it doesn't take much to, for them to be damaged. And I think this, this partly explains that. So when it comes to the, some of the, the work that we're doing, I mean, there's so much to talk about. We're also looking at, you know, what are maybe some of the different mechanisms of why these uh, clones and rootstock affects, uh, you know, how they're, how they're impacting hardiness uh, and, and, and so on. So we're doing a lot more work than I'm showing you here. But we are finding that clone selection can be the source of, of cold to to tolerance differences. And even with some of the differences we're finding uh, with respect to uh, the Riesling clones, for example, uh, they might be different, it might, maybe because they're from different origins uh, of the world in terms of where the clones were sourced from. And so if they're all, let's say, uh, let's say it's Sauvignon Blanc and they're all Loire clones, uh, you know, that might be a reason why they're more similar uh, compared to, uh, you know, if they were clones sourced from um, regions that are more diverse with respect to their climate. So that's something that we're interested in looking at. Um, influence of rootstock is less apparent, but there are some effects. And the one thing that we're starting to find is that the interaction of clone and rootstock cannot be ignored. And particularly when you're looking at specific sites where rootstock selection may be more important, um, you know, because of a certain attribute of the soil, uh, I think that's where rootstock will be more, uh, it's gonna be more apparent. Uh, and the other thing is uh, using rootstocks uh, that aren't suitable, you're going to have huge differences. So we're looking at rootstocks that are already suitable to our climate, but we're looking at some of the, at these smaller differences uh, to see uh, what kind of effects we get. But there is definitely a clone and rootstock interaction that can't be ignored. You know, this is, goes back to climate change and, and, uh, and looking at weather variation and weather extremes, and they are really, really different. Climate will impact how that, how those, uh, genotypes perform. And uh, the variation in the weather, both during the growing season and the dormant season is important. I'm 100 conv convinced that growing season and what's happening to those plants going into dormancy uh, and a lot of the things that you do in the vineyard, as we've talked about before in this lecture series, you know, in terms of cultural practices, all those little things do amount to differences in hardiness. You know, everything from the, the quality of the plant material to the type of uh, uh, vine material, or sorry, yeah, the, the, the different clone or rootstock, 
but also what you do uh, during the growing season. That's going to have an impact on your hardiness as well. And so for these studies, we've we've limited all of those. You know, everything's been pruned the same. Everything is consistent in terms of how we grow it. But that will have a big difference as well. The more variability you have in how you're growing the grapes, the more it's going to impact things like acclimation uh, and maximum hardiness, especially. Uh, the study of, that uh, that I talked about also highlighted the lack of, of hardiness uniformity uh, for of a cultivar like Sauvignon Blanc. And one thing that we found was it was worsened by unfavorable acclimation weather. And this goes again into a bit of that, uh, the discussion I was just having with, with the growing uh, season conditions, because there was some overlap between our growing season conditions and, and the acclimation process, for example. You know, as, as the fruit is maturing, the vines are also maturing and getting ready for the winter. Uh, this kind of repeats what I said, but I, with the clones, what we're finding is that uh, not all clones of, of a cultivar have the same cold hardiness. Uh, and the impact of, of some clones uh, are larger in some years, as I, as I alluded to earlier. Um, right now, we're expanding our work, and I'm, I'm so excited to be looking at new clones to our region, as well as new rootstocks. Uh, and so I think we're going to really uh, start to, you know, learn more about all of this and then learn more about the mechanisms of hardiness as well. That's all going to uh, build on our knowledge of, of how plant material impacts hardiness and, and, and also the, the changes in our climate. Uh, rootstocks, they do have some impacts, but they are less consistent. It is more complicated without question. And we do... Are, are, we do find that there are some clone rootstock interactions, you know, similar to how what we found with how 239 and Riesling, when it was grafted to one rootstock, it was, uh, it, or one rootstock seemed to be better for that clone uh, versus uh, uh, 49, which seemed to do better on another clone. The one thing I will say right off the bat though, without even doing all of this type of research, if you have a poor rootstock selection, it's going to make a huge difference and you'll have an immediate impact on winter survival. I, I evaluated just for fun. I picked up some rootstock that were more California, you know, uh, centric with respect to uh, the rootstock. And uh, those vines didn't even make it past the first winter. So, uh, you know, if I would make any recommendations to the industry is, you know, use what we have and what we know works at this moment. And like I said, we hope to, move forward with more and more information as these evaluation programs go forward. And we'll tie this in with, with our work that we're doing with this project with Canadian Grapevine Certification Network to feed this information into our, into our domestic clean plant program. So I know I'm, I'm just over 45 minutes here, so I'll finish off with this, that it is important and it's gonna be more increasingly important as we're having climat, uh, climate change uh, to be doing regional trials for not only cultivars, but also clone and rootstock. And when we look at cultivar clones and rootstocks, the impact on hardiness, uh, it, it can be dynamic, and, but the growing season influences have to be taken into consideration. I'm convinced of that. Uh, and what we do need to find is plant material and vine material that's matched to site conditions, uh, because that will be the most resilient to the effects of climate change and just weather in general. So we're already starting to understand uh, where, you know, the uh, Riesling grows best, Chardonnay grows best, Gamay. Now, if we can even fine tune even more to have even more resilient and even better plant material within those cultivars, that's perfect. And so through this regional clone and rootstock selection, uh, it helps support our industry. And like I said, I think we have to get away from the traditional way of, uh, of, of, of suitability for varieties and, and get away from just looking at maximum hardiness and to look at how susceptible they might be uh, to you know, poor fall conditions and poor acclimation, or perhaps uh, you know, the, their, their susceptibility to have rapid deacclimation, which on either end of the equation there uh, will result in, in, in winter injury beyond just the, the maximum cold uh, uh, period of the winter and in in those critical temperatures then. And so, I really also think that when it comes to studies and reporting of cultivar hardiness, that we do also mention the clone and rootstock in there as well. So with that, I'd like to thank, you know, all my entire lab group, um, graduate students, technicians, everybody 
all the support uh, from industry, my collaborators who I work with so closely on these projects, uh, the technical service team here at Brock, and obviously all the growers who collaborate with us. We, we are doing work even with our formal trials with our industry partners and all of their access to their sites has really helped. And without question, the visionaries of our industry, uh, it's really helped us to get a kickstart on this research that we're doing that I presented today. But if it wasn't for some of these visionaries doing uh, the, the work long ago um, and looking and thinking about clone and rootstock, you know, we might not have the industry we have because that, I think that was one reason why we were able to really have a shift to growing vinifera is not only choosing the right varieties, but even looking at some of the better clones. And if you look at uh, some of the clones we're using, uh, and if I look at the comparisons to new clones, they're not, the differences aren't as great. Uh, and if you look at rootstock, that's a perfect example. So many different partners, uh, funders, and I want to just have a slide here to acknowledge them all. Uh, and, and, and thank you to, uh, for everybody for their funding and, and for their support for this research. And I look forward to uh, tell you the next steps uh, in terms of what we're finding and, and learn more about uh, how, how clone and rootstocks and, and cultivars uh, respond to our conditions now and moving forward. So I guess I'll stop sharing my screen. Excellent. And all right. Well, listen, thank you very much, Dr. Wilworth. Uh, it, it's so fascinating um, to, to learn more about this. And, and um, you know, myself as, a, as an outsider, I, it, it's just incredible to see the amount of data and, and um, you know, how, how exciting you are uh, at the prospect of collecting more and that, that you know, that constant uh, refresh of information and, and obviously the impact that it has on the industry is just so uh, so fascinating. So uh, thank you so much for for your presentation. And uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, so if you don't mind, I will uh, I'll, I'll pass along some of those questions here. Um, so just kind of going from some of the uh, the older questions up. I think we have three or four here. So the first question is: uh, Is there any relationship between cold hardiness and heat tolerance uh, or drought tolerance? Yeah, there there are some relationships. It seems with uh, with tolerance of of drought and uh, in how um, how different irrigation regimes, for example, and and the stress on the plants uh, can impact uh, dormancy and also might have some hardiness responses too. Uh, but we haven't looked really closely at that here and under our conditions. Um, but likely there are some relationships there. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, what is the LT percentage, 10%, uh, 50%, 100% for coldest temp hardiness? I don't understand the question. Um, can you repeat that? Sure, and, and I apologize. Uh, um, oh, it, sorry, it, the, the, the person just uh, clarified um, and just said, uh, got it from the slides, uh, LTE 50%, is it? Mm -hmm. So LT50 is the, the predicted temperature at which 50% of the buds will be killed, will be frozen. LT10 is the percentage at which 10% of the buds will be frozen. And so we, we use this as um, uh, a way to uh, determine, you know, basically just like your lethal temperature 50 for toxicity and so on. Uh, we use that for a lot of our research program to, to, to determine what the cold tolerance of the plant is. And then LT10 is is when generally when we start to see freeze injury. So we'll use that for a lot of our service that we do in terms of when a, a grower might use mitigation strategies such as a wind machine. Oh, I see. Interesting. Okay. Uh, next question. How frequently is data for PEC updated in VinAlert? So PEC data is is generally updated um, every every month. Okay, um, and then uh, final uh, final question here is: uh, Are the relationships between clone and rootstock consistent in different environments? 
that is what we're looking at right now. When we want to look at how these different clones in rootstocks, uh, how they differ with respect to be, being grown on, on different soils. It may, we might find more of the clone rootstock interaction uh, effect, uh, particularly, or more of a rootstock effect maybe when we start looking at different uh, soil types. So one of our research plots is, is planted uh, on a sandy loam soil and the other one's on a real heavy uh, soil and heavy clay soil. And so we, we, we think that there may be differences related to site. And this is where we all want to uh, use this information to determine on the most appropriate combinations to use uh, across Ontario or even uh, particularly Canada. Now, the one thing that I, we don't know yet is how consistently these clones may perform in different regions across Canada. So one of the benefits of, of this program and what we're trying, what we hope to do is look to identify Canadian clones, like have a clonal selection program for our own country. And we're looking at this already and we want to know if we find cultivars or like selections in the vineyard, let's say in Ontario, and they, they seem to be getting through the winter a lot better than other ones and we start to test them and we find that they are more cold tolerant and so on. What we need to do is really take those, plant them in British Columbia, plant them in other regions and see if we get that consistent effect. Cause it might just be a, a true, uh, you know, wanna make sure that that, if that, that uh, difference is real and, or it's consistent across the uh, different growing regions. Because we do find even with clones in general, um, and this is why the regional information is so important to do your regional evaluations, is that you take a clone that does really well in California or in France and you transplant it here, it may not have the exact same type of characteristics based on our growing conditions. You know, one thing is like uh, that we've found and even when um, others have come from, let's say from um, New Zealand and they've come over for things like the Covey Lecture Series, they, they look at a Sauvignon Blanc uh, cluster and they're like, I've never seen Sauvignon Blanc clusters this type before. And they're like, what clone is this? Well, it's this clone. Well, it's, I, I've never, it's not like that here. So it, it, the region does have a, an influence for sure. And so that's why I mentioned that it's really important to be doing these, each, these evaluations in, the major, in, 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 in your major growing regions. Still lots of work to be done, uh, clearly. I, I think this is one of those things where the, <laughs> the work will never be done, that's for sure. So, um, well, that's all the questions, uh, Dr. Wilworth. So thank you very much again uh, uh, for your presentation and thank you to everybody who took part and, uh, and watched the presentation and, and, and asked questions. Um, I'll just remind you that uh, this lecture from today and, and all the other lectures as part of this Covey lecture series, they will be available on the website at some point in the near future at uh, brocku.ca slash Covey. Um, and of course you can find uh, more information about the series and about everything that's happening uh, at Covey on that website as well. Now I do want to point out uh, that this week we have a second leg lecture scheduled, uh, just a, a reschedule from, a, uh, from an earlier week. Um, so tomorrow actually we have another one uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Joaquin Schultz, um, also from Brock University here, um, who's going to present uh, his topic about uh, augmented reality marketing in the wine industry, which is which is going to be fascinating as well. So um, that presentation is tomorrow, uh, tomorrow March 24th uh, at 3 p.m. same time as today. So um, we hope that you can join us again tomorrow for that one and uh, for for future uh, Covey lecture series uh, events. So once again, thank you so much uh, to Dr. Wilworth for the presentation, and thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Thank you everyone for joining.